How do we know that, that you wouldn't know without uh, the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible say? Jesus speaking said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. <coughs> now, where's the Father? He's in heaven. He's, he's on the throne. We, we talked a lot about the, the, the Trinity or the three ways that God has made himself known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? So if he makes himself known to us, he said, Jesus said, you wouldn't know about me and who I am, is what he's saying. You wouldn't know that I'm the Christ, the Messiah. He'd already had that conversation with, with Peter, uh, unless the Father told you. Remember, he told Peter, said, flesh and blood didn't tell you about me, but my Father in heaven did. Well, how did he do that? Through his Spirit, which is omnipresent. What does the word omnipresent mean? Everywhere at once. He can be everywhere at once. That way he can be with uh, with all of us believers at one time. And he can also be whispering, because many times it's in a still, quiet voice, to the unbelievers, Jesus is. Jesus is real. And we, we saw that in, in scriptures that the Holy Spirit would always do what? Testify of Jesus. Why is that so important? Who can get to heaven without Jesus? According to scripture, who can get to heaven without Jesus? Can you earn your way? Are you good enough? The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Right? And, and the Bible says all of us have sinned. It's on the wall over there. Everybody sins and comes come short of the glory of God. It's on the wall over here. It says in the wages of sin or the punishment of the earning of sin is death. And that's death eternal. That's scary stuff. But then it says this. But the gift of life. Sometimes it says free gift. And let me tell you, that's redundant. That means you said the same thing twice. If it's a gift, does it cost you anything? <coughs> If you earn it, is it a gift or is it earnings? It's earnings. That's not a gift. If you've got to work for it, it's a reward maybe. It's this, but, but it's not a gift. So free gift it is redundant. If, if you have to pay for it or earn it, it's not a gift. Right? So you're saying the same thing. Free gift, gift is just two. He said, but the gift of eternal life. Wow. We can get eternal life without earning it ourselves. Amen. How many is up for that? Heaven without having to earn it. But then there's a condition. Here's the condition. It says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. One way to heaven, his name is Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Darrell, you're just very intolerant of all the other ways people have come up with. Why don't you tolerate, why, why is it okay with you that people can earn their way or go to this God of this name or all those other kind of things? <laughs> Nobody else paid the price for my sin. And I can't. What do I owe for my sin? Death. The problem with being dead is it's hard to get anything after you're dead. Amen? And, and so, the only thing that I can pay for my sins to, to make it justified and all that is, is a death. Right? And yours won't do. Yours won't do for me. Because you're not perfect. I know some of you think you are. I know many of you spouses think that your spouse is right. <laughs> that was smart people. Okay? But, but, but nobody is. Everybody seems to come short. But one perfect one could. His name is Jesus. And he did. He took my death. He paid it for me. He died in my place. He would rather die than see me go to hell. And he did. Amen? Buddha did. Mohammed didn't. All the other, the, the, the God of the Hindus didn't, the, the God of this didn't, all that. Listen, that, that's their freedom to, to believe what they want. But nobody else paid the price so that I could have the gift. And I can't earn it on my own. So, how important is it the Holy Spirit says, Did y'all hear me? I'm whispering. You barely heard me? Jesus is. He is the great I am. He is. The great I am. He is God. And, and what he's saying is right. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to us. So none of us could get there without that. Without God stepping in. And we said there's a name for when God steps into our reality. Into the natural world where we live. When the supernatural steps into the natural, there's a word for that. What's that word? Miracle. If you know about Jesus Christ and who he is, you experience the miracle. You don't have to run over here where there was this picture of this or a pancake that had this thing that looked like somebody on it. Or you don't have to go there for a miracle. You've had a miracle. Amen? 
In fact, every time you see, listen, every time you see someone make Jesus Lord of their life, they went from being on death row, right? Dead men walking, as they would say, on death row, to life. They were spiritually dead, and they came to life. So how many of you have seen the dead raised? Spiritually. Every time someone comes to the Lord, you've literally seen the dead raised. And if you think about that, the Bible also said that the, the Word of God is foolishness that don't have the Spirit of God because the Word is spiritually <clears throat> understood. In other words, we are deaf. We are deaf to the Word of God until the Holy Spirit opens our ears. So how many of us have, have seen the, the what? The people who can't hear? Get to where they can hear. Right? And, and how about... We have nothing really to say to get somebody to heaven until the Holy Spirit comes and lets us know that we have it, and then we proclaim it. We did. We were talking about a bunch of stuff. How many of y'all have heard a lot of people talk a lot, but they never said anything? But now we have something to say. The Bible says the dumb will speak. <coughs> right? So all of these things, we've seen miracles spiritually, and a lot of times we walk right by and didn't even notice them. Who convicts us of our sin? How many of you thought it was your grandma's job? How many grandmas thought it was your job? <laughs> Thump those ears and do what have you. That's something the Bible teaches. Who convicts us of our sins? The Holy Spirit does. We saw that in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 as it described the duties. Who convicts the world of sin and judgment? All that that's going to happen. Why does the world get pretty shook up when they hear about Jesus? If he's nobody, they can just smile. Oh, that's those poor people. It's so sad that they believe in this guy they've never seen. That's, that's how they look at it. But they don't do that. They get angry. Why do they get angry? The Holy Spirit has convicted them about judgment. This is real stuff. And I don't want to face it, so I'll just try to kill that witness. And they get angry. Now listen, we're not to get angry back. They're our job. Who did God call us to witness to? The ones that don't know that it's real. And we're to be better and better witnesses in, in, that, in that effect. Okay? With that said, is it easy? Is it easy to witness to the lost? Is it easy, listen, to retain and build a witness that people will listen to? Let me say that again. Is it easy to be a... Witnessing something is not just seeing it. You're not a witness if you've just seen it. You're a witness if you've seen it and you tell about it. But a lot of people won't listen to people tell about it because they look at their life and, and the, the opposing attorney says, well, you know, didn't you do this horrible thing then? And didn't you do that horrible thing then? And didn't you do this horrible thing then? And people say, I don't have to listen to them. Look, well, they're not a good witness. Their credibility has been, what, trashed. So, we have to build a witness. Uh, I remember being in a, a, a trial one time. I was a witness. I wasn't a defendant. Uh, and, and it was a man who shot somebody. An elderly lady. And it really was, it was a horrible crime. And so, the, the uh, uh, attorney who was trying to get rid of my, my witness, my testimony for seeing this guy, said, isn't it true that you make your living uh, playing music in the honky-tonks and joints and all that kind of stuff? And he was trying to destroy my witness. And, and so I looked back and I said, I did while I was in college. And, and that went right against it because it, it, it said, what? Here's somebody who's trying to move forward with education and what have you. And, and that ended that way. But what was his first thing to do? Try to do what? Nullify my witness. Who will try to nullify your witness? The enemy will. And anyone who plays into his hands, who can play into his hands? Oh. The great man, he had to look at Peter, and Jesus, Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. We can all play into his hands if we fall for his schemes, amen? We can do that. So it is not easy to, to maintain and build our witness. Now, with all that said, we'll get to the, the scripture part. We're talking about veterans. To become a veteran, you have to have been a soldier. And pretty much, guys, and, and I don't think there's any ladies in here who've been, but there have been some wonderful soldiers. Ladies, once you've been a soldier, are you still a soldier? Yes, yeah. You never quit being. Right? The wives are saying, 
You, they, they know. You never quit being. It's because part of who you are. And like I said, when you were up here, you know, separate, you know, the airmen and the army and the marines, they all kind of look at each other, pick at each other. But when they stand here as veterans, it's one brotherhood. There's no question because they've done what? They, they, they've offered. They wrote a blank check. <laughs> Here's my life. Use it to defend our nation. And, and that's how it is, right? Uh, was it always easy and fun? No. Did you ever get to think for yourself or did you have to think as a group and do what the commander said? Did they love independent thinkers in the group? No, that's what boot camp does. It says, no, you don't have a thought. It's our thought, right? It's a, the training sergeant's thought. Okay. We make Jesus Lord of our life and many times we give more credits to a training sergeant. What, what, what was your title as a training sergeant? That's the one I was looking for. But we get more crazy. Because Jesus gives us a choice to do what? To think for yourselves or to think enough to say, I've thought for myself and his way is always better than mine. I'm going his way. But every time we went the other way, what did we do to our credibility? We, we, we voided it in that situation, didn't we? Every time we stepped away from God's way, we voided it in that situation and we hurt our credibility about getting that, that word out. So what we want to look at this morning is, is it becoming a soldier of Christ. Does the Bible mention that? It just so happens that it does. So we're going to talk about that. So let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for, for being there. Thank you again for these precious ones who have stood between us and evil, following your example, offering everything for us, following your example. Lord, so they honor you even more. They give us pictures, better pictures of who you are, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray today that we, we experience your word more than just here. Father, that, that it's spiritually discerned or, or, or so made so we can understand it and apply it to our lives. We lift it up in Jesus' name. Amen. Timothy was teaching his, no, not Timothy, Paul was teaching his student, Timothy. And he's getting in 2 Timothy, this is like his swan song. This is his last letter. This is the one where he's telling him goodbye. What do you want to tell somebody if this is the last opportunity that you have? My grandmother wrote a pamphlet but not long before she died and it said, Now I done told you, now you know. <laughs> Anything she hadn't told us before, she wanted to be sure. And she made us responsible. She says, Now I done told you, now you know. So, okay, so we, we have a choice. Sweet, wonderful lady, <laughs> but she wasn't weak. And so she'd written that. This is kind of the, the letter that, that Paul is writing to Timothy. He said, You've heard me teach things. Somehow we missed one verse, but let me read you the first verse. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in what? What God has chosen to give you that you didn't deserve. The grace of Christ Jesus. Okay? God has given you something that you didn't deserve. If, uh, if you flew a, a, an airplane in the military, if you were the pilot, how long would it have taken you to save up for that little jet thing that, that flies around? How long would it take? Would you have ever saved up enough money to buy it? No, there's no way. They're not very big, but they cost a lot of money, those little fighters that they've got and the other things, right? And, and what about the education it took to get you ready to fly? Back when a million dollars was a lot of money, it's not as much as it used to be, but it's still a lot more than me. And I looked at my life's earnings as a teacher, didn't get anywhere near that. But it was about a million dollars back when Top Gun was made as a picture, and Tom Cruise is getting older now, right? It's about a million dollars that they would put into a pilot's training to get them ready. Did that person deserve that? Kind of hard to say. Well, how much greater is God's riches than America's riches? So he gives us grace, the stuff that we didn't deserve, to get us equipped to do what? He says, be strong in, in the grace. He says, you've heard me say things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. <coughs> Timothy, you've heard me since you were very young preach the good news about Jesus, the gospel. When we say gospel, it means good news, but to us Christians, we mean absolute truth. Amen? Somebody preaches the gospel, we say that's absolute truth. He says, you've heard me preach it and you've seen it done but before reliable witnesses. People who said, I've seen it, I'm going to follow it. They were reliable. How do you know? They believed it so much that that's what they followed. What makes us unreliable? Well, yeah, I, I heard it. I, I believe it, kind of, but I'm going this way. 
It's not as reliable, right? He said, if you've seen it, you've seen reliable witnesses. He says, now what I want you to do is teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass it on to others. You've got it. Did he say, what I want you to do is go hide it under a rock and keep it safe? Is that what he said to do with it? He said to do what? Pass it out. Share it. I, I, it was uh, Doubting Thomas who said to Jesus, only you have the words of life. <laughs> and so if you've got the words of life and you keep them hid under a rock, who's not getting them? Everybody else. Your neighbor down the street, your child, your grandchild. If you're not what? Pass them out. And if you're not a credible witness, then they may not take them as credible. Amen? And, and so we want to build that kind of witness. What kind of witness? Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. As a good soldier. What can we learn from our, our soldiers? Are, are there things that they've experienced that many of us have not? Sure. But, but there's things that we can observe and we can learn that, that they've done. I want to look at just a few of those. He's talking and he talks to Timothy. He says, I, I, I want to thank God for you. And, and I serve in a clear conscience. He says, I'm looking to see you again. All of those kind of things that, that he's got to. And he gets down to the place where he's talking. And he says, God saved us and called us to live a holy life. Did you know that in, in the Gulf War, that if our young men had stayed at home, more of them would have died at home than died in the war itself? Did you know that? I mean, if you do the statistics of how many have they stayed at home compared to how many got killed in the war, they died for different reasons. Car wrecks, drug overdoses, horrible things like that. But, but while they were there, who was looking after them? Who kept them safe on that compound? You know, that, that, that drill sergeant that was that big bear of a person and all that kind of stuff. But he's like mama when they get to where they're going. You go now, you eat, you drink, you, you clean, you be sure you get plenty of water, hydration, I think they call it. You do all of those kind of things. And they keep you what? As safe as possible. And so there's no running around and doing things to do that. He said, God saved us and called us to holy living. That drill sergeant does what? <laughs> he's right there with you in making sure that you're safe. And so you're living a, a soldier's life in that place. Ready because what's going to be coming? The enemy. Who keeps us and leads us to safe places besides still water and the green pasture? Who does that? Our God does. Amen? He does those kind of things. He said he did this not because we deserve it. That means it's grace. It wasn't deserved. But because he has a plan from the beginning of time. And to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. Okay? He did all of those things, and then he did what? He gave us a power that was way above us. How much power did God give you? He gave you the power to go from life to death by one choice. Right? That, that you could say a soldier has the power of life and death with one little move of their finger. Right? One push of a button and all those kind of things. God gave you the power of life and death. By one choice. You can do what? You can have life and life eternal by do, making one choice. Say, I want Jesus. It says over here, confess with your mouth. Jesus is your Lord, your commander, your ultimate commander. Right? Confess with your mouth. Jesus is your Lord. Believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. Will be saved. That's a lot of power. Why would God give you and me that much power? He loves us. Okay. We give that power to, to our, our soldiers in many ways. Power over life and death, but it's for more taking life. Here we can give life. He also gives us power to pass that power on to other people. You empower someone when you don't know how to get to heaven to make that choice. And so you give them the power of life over death. And, and so that's what he does. He, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. God Almighty we, we read last week, when you believe, chooses to live within you. How much power is that? God said, let there be light. Boom, there was light. That's a lot of light. That's a lot of power, amen? He created things in six days. People say, well, how can you do it in six days? 
Here's the other question. Why did he wait six whole days? Why didn't he just say, let everything be the way I want it to be? And in an instant, it could have been there, right? But he chose to show us his process, and he gave us good reasons for that. Or he allowed us to think on the good reasons that he did. And when he got to man, he said, everything else was good. What did he say about man? You were very good. You are the ultimate in His creation. Wow. How can anyone have low self-esteem? We do. We believe the lies. But how can we have low self-esteem when He says, You are very good compared to the sun and the heavens and the this and the that. All the animals and stuff. They were good, but you were very good. <coughs> that's the power that's within us in the Holy Spirit. He said, You know, everybody deserted me. Even this guy and that other guy. I'm not going to say their names because I just embarrassed myself. But the Lord, may the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus. I learned his name because he's the good guy. Okay? Onesiphorus and, and, and all of his family, because he often visited, encouraged, encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in change. He was a friend that stood by me close as a brother. Who else is that like? <coughs> it's like soldiers. But it's also like our Lord Jesus. Amen? And when he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. What's another part of the soldier's creed? Which one do you leave behind? You don't leave a, a, a fellow soldier behind on the battlefield. You don't do that. Onesiphorus was what? A fellow soldier that, that was with uh, uh, Paul in, in this process. So we, we see these things. When he's talking about a, a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he knows what a good soldier is. He says, let, let me tell you something else about soldiers. They don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. I don't know if y'all heard it on the news. We had an election last week. Anybody hear about it? You may not have heard it. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I can get tangled up in those ideas. I taught civics. I taught American history. All those kind of things. And I can really get there. And I have to be careful. I have to be careful because I'll get twisted off. It'll consume me. Is that what God called me to be on this earth for? That's not what he called me to be on this earth for. And so when things got very serious to me on the spiritual side, and I wanted to fast and pray, I fasted politics. I cut off my channels, I cut off the news, I cut off all that kind of stuff, because I knew what it could do to me. And it could, it could get me distorted from, I need to be close to God. I, 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 you know, I didn't suffer to do that. But at the same time, is that the first thing that God called me to worry about in this life? To, to be concerned with. He says not to worry, but to be concerned with. That's not what he called me to be concerned with. I want to be a good citizen. He tells me to be a good citizen. Get informed. Do those kind of things. But that's not the first thing. You know why? In four years, they're going to have another election like that. In two years, they're going to have some congressmen and all those kind of things. I've seen several in, in my life, and I know that that's how it happens. But what God called me, you and me to be the most important in our life was eternal things. What God called a soldier, you know, does a soldier, when he was going into battle, say, you know what, they're electing a mayor in my hometown, and, and I just, boy, that guy or that girl, I, just, you know, let the enemy come. I've got to worry about this. <laughs> Is that what the soldier does? What does the soldier do? He gets in his field of fire, and he knows that if he doesn't hold his field of fire, that's going to let somebody overrun his, his uh, buddy on this side or his buddy on this side, and he's not going to think about that other kind of stuff. What does he not do? He doesn't get tied up in things to be in life because people's lives are at stake. We need to be very careful about the priorities that we hold. What should be our number one priority if Jesus is Lord? And if there's true that one day the kingdom of God is going to come and many people will miss it, Many but by, by ignorance. Many by ignorance. There are going to be people who choose to miss it and go into another kingdom. God gave them the choice and they said, we can pray for them, we can be a, a valid witness to them, we can do everything we can, but ultimately they still have that choice, right? But what about those who from ignorance are, are not seeing what a soldier of God looks like, which does what? Proclaims the power of who they're serving. How does America show its power around the world? It's soldiers. Mostly it's soldiers, right? Send the aircraft carrier over there or something like that. that. That's how they show. How does God show his power? How did God choose to reveal himself to a lost and dying world? He said, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, locally, 
in Samaria, a, a place across the border you didn't want to go, into the uttermost parts of the world. Who did he say would be his witnesses? We would. We would be his soldiers. We would be his foot soldiers. Now, when we get there, we're not going to kill him with guns. He calls us to be a priesthood. What does a priest do? Points to God. Points to God. Right? It's a different kind of soldier. But they, he said that's the number one priority. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of the civilians. Don't get tied up so that they're what? They're, it's impossible for them to do their work if they're tied up. And what's the work of the church? Remember what he said? Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of death, the gates of evil. Any way you translate that word, won't prevail against it. But what if the church is over here tied up with things that aren't? Eternal. You have to be very careful. No way did I say don't be a good citizen. I'm talking about priorities. What needs to be first and, and, and all those other things. And he goes on. He says, soldiers who, who don't get tied up, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. This is the New Living Translation. The officer who enlisted them. We just read a little while ago. Who enlisted you? Who told you that Jesus was the way to go? There were some humans, but, but you never could have understood spiritual things unless who was talking to you? Holy the Holy Spirit. God Almighty in His Spirit. And, and so, who are we pleasing? We can never please God, He says. He says, for then they cannot please the, the officer who listen. If we're done what? Tied up with things that have nothing to do with the war that's raging around you and I right now. How many of you agree that there's a war between good and evil raging around us right now? There's a war raging between what? Those who will go to heaven and those who won't. And the enemy who's trying to hold them down. And the Savior who's reaching for every one of them. And you're part of his arm. You're the body of Christ. You're the physical body of Christ. Amen? So think about that. We're not going to please the one who enlisted us if we get too tied up in temporary things. Does that make sense? It says athletes can't win a prize unless they follow the rules. What if the athlete is running his 100 meter dash and he says, you know what, I really don't like my lane. That one looks a whole lot softer. It won't be so bad on my tennis shoes. They'll last long. I'm going to run in that lane. What happens? He gets disqualified. He didn't follow the, the rules of conduct. Do soldiers have rules of conduct that they follow? Keeps them out of jail if they follow those things. There's a discipline to being in this war. Who is our teacher? Who is the one who gives us rules of conduct? God does. We can go off and we come up with our own rules. We know what works on the earth and all that kind of stuff. But if God says, I'm going to give you weapons that aren't in this world, what happens? We can lose our credibility. We've got to be careful with that and follow the rules of conduct. How about farmers? We've talked about soldiers and athletes. What about farmers? It's an interesting verse. Hard-working farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. How many farmers do you know that say, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to start, you know, land level the ground, get, get all of it ready in, 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 in the winter and have it all set. I'm going to have it perfect. So when the spring comes, I, I'm ready. And I know exactly when. I'm going to look at the weather carefully. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my, my rice planted at the perfect time to, to get the best growth and all those kind of things. And I'm going to carefully watch the water. And I'm going to flood it when it needs it. I'm going to drain it when it needs it. I'm going to apply the fertilizer to it when it needs it. And I'm going to put the herbicide to it when it needs it. I'm not a, a rice farmer. You rice farmers tell me if I'm in the right area or not. Either way, get the point is there are many details that go into making that rice crop. And when the rice crop is ready, I'm going to go fishing. I ain't going to worry about that. They do that too. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not going to worry about that. I, I, you know, I, I, if it comes, it's fine. Why would you work that hard and then get to the point of victory and say, nah, not interested. I'll worry about that next year with the next crop. That's kind of scary. It says what? That farmer should be what? They should be there for those first fruits. They should get to enjoy See the fruit of their work. Right? We should what? Don't throw your witness away at the end when, when you've done so much. Don't, don't do that kind of stuff. Be the soldier that, that presses on. Uh, have you ever heard of snatching a, a defeat out of the jaws of victory? You've got the battle won. You've got the battle won. And at the end you say, I'm going to leave. 
Man, I could go that other 10 feet and be sure that nobody else in my platoon dies and all that kind of stuff. But if I leave, time's up. I'll see y'all later. That's not how soldiers do. Soldiers come home and have this guilt complex sometimes for the rest of their life because they left two behind. Their brothers and sisters behind. Even if it, why? Because if I'd have been there, maybe this one would have been all right or that one would have been all right and stuff. The, the first picture, you want to get the victory and nail it down and hold it. Right? And that's this farmer. You don't back away when it's time. It just doesn't make any kind of sense. How much longer do you and I have to be soldiers for God in this plane of existence with, with the people around us that we love and care about? How much longer do we have? We don't know. It could be at any moment. And we lose our what? Our opportunity. Our opportunity. Just think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. The Lord will help you. Do you remember what it said? The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of Christ. The Lord is here in His Holy Spirit, and He will help us understand these things. When you go watch the football game, will they help you understand these things? They're trying to shut the games down a little more. They were like three hours and six minutes. They were losing the viewers. They're going to try to compress them some. Well, they talk a lot to you about the Lord and the most important things of life then. They won't. Listen, uh, not against football games, but, but I, what, I, what I want to look at. Will the newscasters tell you how to understand these things? No, they'll give you something totally different. Will the sitcoms tell you how to understand these things? They won't tell you that, right? Who will tell you it says? The Lord will tell you. How many hours a week do we let the Lord talk to us? And how many hours a week do we let all these other influences talk to us? And what's at stake? Our souls, if, if you're here, you made Jesus Lord of your life, that's settled. But our effectiveness is at stake. And the lost souls around us is at stake. Does God say don't live? No, He says be in the world but not of the world, right? So, we know about culture, and I'm not putting down these other things. I'm just asking you, do the math. How much time do we have where we allow the Lord to talk to us? And by the way, I'm not your teacher this morning. The Holy Spirit, God is. He can take the words on the wall and the words that I'm saying, and He can bring them to you in a way that you understand for your situation. Right? Way better than I ever could. He's talking to me right now because I get convicted when I read these things. But the Bible says it's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. I may swing it that way, but it's cutting back this way. And it needs to because I need a lot of heart surgery to be more like my Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? And, and so that's why we're all here together looking at that. Has the Lord convicted any of us this morning? about what's important. Are we soldiers who are willing to, what do you say? Oh. What do you say about being a soldier of Christ? We might have to what? Endure what? Suffering. suffering. But I enjoy comfort so much better than suffering. Do you? I really enjoy comfort better than suffering. You give me the two, and I'm probably going to choose comfort nearly every time. Unless you can show me where that suffering, where that suffering is going to bring up something of greater value than my momentary comfort. And isn't that what we're talking about this morning? Are we willing to put up with the discomfort, the suffering, when we're talking about eternal life for the people around us, and especially those people near and dear to us? And the more we think about Jesus, and we recognize that that person over there we may not have ever seen before, may never see again, is very dear to Jesus. Who did he die for? And when we love him... I'm going to tell you, you want to get to my heart, you bless my kids and my grandkids. Right? I mean, you do something nice for them. If I, want to, if I care about Jesus, I want to bless what? Those are His kids and those who could be His kids. Are we soldiers of Christ? Are we soldiers of comfort? It's a big question that we need to ask each time we make a decision. Each time we make a decision. If you've never enlisted, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. You've never enlisted in the kingdom of God to serve in God's army. It's an army with different weapons. It's an army that brings life instead of death. Right? But if the Holy Spirit's talking to you, what's he saying? He says Jesus is exactly who this word says he is. And when you get to the point you can believe it enough to follow him and you say, I confess Jesus is my Lord and I believe in my heart God raised him from the dead. 
you're enlisted. He says, you will be saved. But if we're enlisted, are we weekend warriors or less? Are we soldiers for life? Soldiers for the rest of our life and soldiers to win life. Soldiers for life. Amen. <coughs> That's the question at our common invitation. So let's go to the Lord in prayer.